Hey, howdy, hello, welcome to another video. Uh, as you can see, it's really cold outside, so what, what I wanted to do is actually take you inside into the realm of my gear. Fell over. So somehow the mechanism that holds the, the tripod in place has broken. So um, this is gonna be a little more difficult of a shoot than I originally had thought. There's snow all over the lens. Um, I know a lot of people like to, you know, bring you outside when they show you their gear. So I wanted to spice it up and actually take you inside where we actually look at uh, uh, the gear that I'm running for vinyl and for music. Some of the design process, the things I thought through in order to make the space work, to make the room treatment work so I could listen to stuff in a really stable environment. Um, unlike what you're seeing outside today. So. Let's go there. I think it's about negative seven out today, which is not too bad. Negative seven Fahrenheit, you know, could be worse. And uh, like the whole tree itself is frozen and is bending in the weight of the wind. You can hear it crackle. God, it's kind of scary. <laughs> Listen to that. So just bear with me and the, the, there's the wind. Yeah, but anyway. Snow drift blowing around me. Um, it's been a long time coming, years in the making. I've learned a lot along the way. I've done a lot DIY. Some companies that do it better do certain aspects of it for me. Um, I've swapped out different pieces of gear. I've mighty handful of recording stuff. But I want to get at today uh, just more the focus on the music listening and listening playback experience that I run. Um, so yeah, let's go inside. I'm going to make some tea and we'll just sit down and talk about it. Sound good? Cool. Retrace my steps here. All right. Yeah, I do think this whole tree is just going to snap off. I think I'll be okay. Let me just get back inside real quick. Just a couple inches of snow. All right, maybe four inches or so. Almost there. All right, welcome inside. So I'm handheld, and now what the heck are we looking at? This is the edge of the attic loft room. Now this right here is uh, sound blankets from Vocal Booth to Go. Vocal Booth to Go is a company that basically designs these sound blankets that are made from the same sort of material you need to actually absorb sound. So just lining the walls with these, before we go in, I just want to show you this because this sort of divides the room without having to actually modify the room that we have here. So this is the edge of it. Got a little charging station. Just trying to utilize the space as best I can. So as you walk in, immediately see the room change. Now this is the rubber mats on the floor. I wanted to design this room because it's a shared space, because it's a modification of a you know room that's already a part of the house. And I didn't want to change the room itself. Got to work with what you got sometimes. So I wanted the floor and the walls and the space to be as isolated from any other part of the house as possible. So this is rubber mats, Home Depot rubber mats interlocking, six long and four wide. So, all right, I'm gonna show you the full room build next because I want you to see the whole thing from general to specific, why each component is important to honing it in. Let's check it out, all right. So this is what I see every day. This is also where I work. Um, that's the wall organization stuff and the listening station, the workstation. On the wall, we have all sorts of more sound blankets above us to the side. And we have all of these DIY acoustic panels, four or five right here right now. If we turn around, we can see shared retro gaming station. Got an acoustic panel in front of it, freestanding and uh, a giant Oh, giant custom build, bought it from a guy who custom built it, and I custom India inked it matte black. It's four foot by four foot. Solid cedar, weighs like 120 pounds. All right, let's open that up so you can see it. This is the cedar diffuser. And just next to it here, we have some interesting stuff. We have a custom DIY panel in the corner, kind of a corner trap, not really. It's in the corner, just to cover as much space as possible for absorption. 
and we have more absorption on these windows. I, I wanted to keep the windows in there. The blinds behind it are nice, thick IKEA blinds. You know, they're okay, but I really wanted something in front of it that was substantial. So I got the highest NRC coefficient from this company called Rose Brand, and they made this custom for the dimensions of this window. So it's actually one whole thing, just, just kind of, you know, Navy SEAL tied up there in the middle, perfect knot. Uh, you know, just something so that it lifts up in the middle if I actually want to use the blinds uh, and still cover as much space as possible. But I can lower that down if I want to have complete coverage of window from floor to ceiling. This is basically, I mean, we're talking about a work of modern modern art and aesthetic, gorgeous beauty to, to look at there. I mean, just beautiful tape job. All this is is a, some dude on YouTube's design of a, what they call a Corsi Rosenthal box, but it's just for air purification. These are just the same thing as you'd put in your house. They're almost HEPA grade, like one coefficient below HEPA grade. And this is for dust. This is for sensitive electronics like the computer, like the turntable, vinyl, basically just to remove the, as much dust particles and for smell. It really does work and it's stupid cheap. Whole build cost me like 60 bucks. And if I need new filters, it's like 60 bucks once a year. I think it roughs out to maybe a hundred bucks once a year. It's great. I just changed the filters on it. It's a functional thing and I can move from here or somewhere else in the house if I need to. Oh, it's just so custom. We got little shark fin cardboard plates on the corners. Beautiful, okay. Everything does affect the sound. So I built a nice thick, roughly eight inch deep, I call it a bass trap. It's still just like for general absorption of general frequencies, but it's eight inches thick, it's four foot tall, it's freestanding. And the goal is to sort of match the four foot. These are all f are roughly four foot, so it's easy to build in the insulation panels on the inside, just for absorption. It really does work. Super ridiculously thick and heavy. The boards are also made of <laughs> cedar. I, I don't know what I was thinking, or oak, sorry, oak, hardwood. I just wanted hardwood. I love hardwood. It's a little ridiculous. This The thing that the Ikea thing is mounted to is also an, <laughs> an oak board. It just wanted as much real wood. I mean, I, I'm a guitarist. I love wood. And this thing too, this is a, I think some dude makes these on uh, reverb.com custom. It's a design off of Reverb.com's studio. And this is their like Chicago simple diffuser, not very thick, as you can see. Cool aesthetic, cool diffusion. I did end up painting it black. It had all sorts of different colors in it. I switch it up if I feel like it too. They, they're all interchangeable, four different separate pieces. Sweet. And then we're looking right beside it. We got the wall of boob cube with the vinyl. I made a whole video on that. We'll get to the vinyl. This is this goes with the lighting theme. We'll get to the lighting in a second. It's basically a Philips LED light strip in a diffuser all the way across the room to the corner and down just kind of plugs in to another diffuser, which is another freestanding diffuser, same as the ones over here. Um, they're not all exactly the same thickness. They're all about four inches. Some of them might be six. The ones behind the speakers are six and the one in the corner is six, but you know, just freestanding four inch. Also because it just ran out of insulations. Four inches was all I needed anyway. It's not really a cloud, but you know, oak type boards. So it's super strong mounted to the stud and the ceiling on a few spots. And uh, same with this. Now that's not hardwood. This is the basically a server guard rack. All right, let's walk back out. We're up against the wall looking in again. Now let's talk lighting. I wanted lighting to be as easy as possible for making videos and for everyday use. To be able to be controlled from my phone so I can really dial it in exactly how it needs to look every day, every video. And every video and every day is different. So I need lighting that adjusts to my needs. I need things movable, interchangeable, and customizable, pre-programmable. I do have some video uh, experience, education background. So, you know, I could have got the whole rig and done a nice lighting setup like they do in facilities. But um, I wanted something that felt residential. I want this to feel as home, as DIY, and cheap, but also not cheap for the sake of cheap, but as just functional as possible. Got this little camera tripod mount that actually mounts to a tripod or freestanding kind of on its own. So I can pop my phone in here and just kind of show you what's going on. This is the Wiz app. You basically set each of these lights and light strips or whatever you got in your house to 
whatever color, whatever preset, and whatever brightness. When you lower this brightness, it instantly changes the brightness. And I can switch up the color. I just wanted a regular. 4000. Now it's bright white. And I can lower that. And I can turn it off completely if I need to. Still super bright because the whole room is lit by several of these. It's actually a series of seven bulbs and one strip. So the Wiz app's great. I can just pop over here, change the strip to whatever color I want or a series of colors. It's not super in-depth, but it has just what I need and the basic controls and it's simple. I also have it set where I can just turn that off and all of these ones connected to the ceiling just go off. These, however, are plugged into the wall, so I have to turn them off separately. That's great. It's also on a circadian rhythm preset. It just went off, but it has a circadian rhythm preset that literally just adjusts the brightness, bright for the morning and darker for night because you don't need blasting lights. Absolutely love that because it makes it so much easier than dialing in settings and fancy expensive lights. The bulbs are not, not the high-end hue. They're like the Wiz, Philips Wiz, which after research is literally just slightly inferior to the hue and Really, I don't want the whole thing to be hue long term anyway. I, I do want some fancy nice lights one day. I just don't need them. I just want to run cables where they need to go and I, I just want to be able to control the lights. Make it look decent overall and that's what it does. Aesthetics are important. Uh, nice and bright for the center area and then generic accent lighting for the back. There's some aesthetic choices I've done here just on the perimeter of the room. Stickers and little mugs and knickknack storage, vinyl of course, and when I'm recording I have musical instruments. But Cables running, server rack, storage, Ikea shelf with boxes, and then cables and recording stuff in the black, and then cleaning supplies and etc. on the middle. And below it, just nerdy computer type or video type extras that I don't need every day. If we do pop in here, let's open it as wide as it go. Have a really nice first layer. We got a NAS with it connected to a UPS. This is how I run. I wanted a basically a 4K editing server that could just hold files and work. That's all it does. And up here we have camera gear, bags and lenses and random crap. Up here, extra storage, like I'm working on a VCR project and extra computer parts that I don't need, maybe a can of spray compressed air. It's just, just kind of there. Great, it works. And I can close that, it's actually a sound blanket, but it's still cracked, for, it's letting heat out. Gotta have cooling tight and <laughs> neat and it just works oh accent ikea rug it's just there this is also for isolation just parts from the home depot floor tile so that you know when i step down uh this is isolated from the wall which is isolated from the isolation gear which we'll talk about in a second from the turntable and the cartridge and that's all isolated down from when it touches the speakers and speakers are as grounded to the rubber that's the concrete blocks that i painted black really sturdy and i mean there's 15 dollars speaker stands and all these different types of speaker stands but i saw a video who, a guy who used to work at ocean way studios had literal concrete blocks from home depot that he just wet lock sealed you know so that they wouldn't uh, get moldy or whatever. And honestly, the tower itself is part of it. I was gonna say, tell me a little bit about this construction underneath <laughs> here. This is the craziest, most industrial, probably strongest speaker stand. That so you built came, these? Yeah, I built them, I went to Home Depot and just kind of went all out. That's but, hilarious. Uh, cheap onstage stands that I had mm -hmm. to where I liked them. But the problem was anytime I would kind of like come over here plug something in, I would risk a, a nudge or anything. And because of the way that the room works, any pivot off center is gonna just throw it all off. Yeah. And so way back when we were working at East West, actually, somebody from Oceanway, their uh, mastering engineer who worked at Oceanway, recommended uh, center blocks. They're the cheapest and best speaker stands. And when I was researching sound anchors and some other speaker stands, those are all upwards of $5,000 for speaker Woo! stands. There's a little bit of math involved in terms of trying to calculate which ones. I had some help from the PMC guys about just some spider over there showed me that he had done a studio back when he was in the East Coast that he built basically everything, the desk and everything out of wood like this and cinder blocks. And we had talked about kind of the physics of it and how it worked. So that led me to this kind of platform design and what I really did find with the whole thing when I put them in first, because there's a little bit of that, they are sound incredible. Like I was worried about these being kind of like basic ported type things and mm -hmm. throwing off the frequency response of the room. But what they really did, especially if they step back a little bit, it, they built the speakers into the room itself, the cement floor. Yeah. And the sound itself is so anchored in that there is a little bit of resonance, especially kind of low end, but it's more just kind of extra oomph and push and punch. And I, I couldn't be happier, honestly, with how they turned out. The trick is wash them before you bring them in. Yeah, uh, spiderwebs. Yeah, spiderwebs, just they're dusty. Yeah. And then I got some like gloss, clear gloss kind of whetstone paint, just slopped it all over them. And cool. Put some vinyl between the speakers and the floor and the cinder blocks and it's a pretty whatever. easy fix. 
and then I just decided to paint them black to go with the aesthetic and make them into speaker stands. Both sides, you know, a little greenery on there too, just for accent. The desk itself is a cool story. It's an auto autonomous base, but I got the DIY kit so that I could grab the desk top from Habitat for Humanity. Just a hunk of wood. Sanded it down and painted it black and just wanted it to be ginormous to fit as much stuff on it as possible. And that's what it does. And it raises and lowers to the exact inches that I need it to be. And <laughs> for standing or sitting or whatever I want and feel like. Flexibility is outstanding. And it goes with the aesthetic. Matte black is where it's at. It's just, it's not as glossy and reflective. It's like the waxier finishes. Just finished with indie ink and i did add a little bit of wax for preservation it really is like the black shows the grain of the wood the texture and it just makes for an interesting unique touch and finish to a very awesome and large desk slash workstation as i'm talking about the speakers too right now i got some I got some panels just freestanding around it for extra isolation but the speakers are definitely off the wall i would say about maybe five to 10% in the room itself. Roughly 45 degree listening angle, direct, like I said, to my tweeters, to, to my ears. An amazingly dialed in room that functions just the way I need it to in a, in a house space. Using basic speakers, but heavy room treatment and absorption. Fabric from Joann's, the black you know, utility. Front speaker fabric, cut just enough for all these panels stapled it all together in the back cleaned it up as best i could i love i love its functionality and freestanding or wall mounting flexibility shout out to the several youtubers and forums and videos that i just watched for hours and hours trying to figure out what i needed it really does work great in conjunction with these rose brand custom curtains in conjunction with the great diffusion the hardwood diffusion and fancy, you know, aesthetic diffusion. Couldn't be happier right now, really. It's just the way I wanted it. It still feels cozy and, and enjoyable for, you know, playback experience. First upgrade of speakers I ever bought in like 2011. So these things have been through the ringer, thrown in several a tote over the years and uh, backs of cars just, uh, just to get sounds. But they, they, they still get sounds, just XLR cable and the old unit into the computer and into the room. That sounds awesome and that's important to me. Just, just you know, high quality room, room sound that is nice for critical listening, nice for the audio visual work in general. And um, it's simple and you know, I'm gonna upgrade these cause they're only like a couple hundred bucks. But I said before I wanted to upgrade these that I wanted the room to sound good before because why put thousand dollar speakers in a room that doesn't sound great? So I'll, I'll dial in the room, I'll get these $200 bad boys, sounding excellent. I'll upgrade the speakers, upgrade some of the gear that it's touching along the way, and we'll get good sounds from there. But I, I cannot stress how important having a nice clean room that sounds great and heavily absorbed, absorption first, then diffusion. I mean, it, it just made listening a pleasure and you can hear things for what they are instead of it being instead of it being clouded by the room i love it it just feels great a little side card here too so when i'm sitting i can put drinks on this and not on this with sensitive gear drinks off the desk I'm tired of seeing these guys with coffee right next to their keyboard i'm like dude that's a disaster waiting to happen or if it's your computer or monitor I just don't even you put a drink right here problem solved all right all right, so it's time to get serious. I mean, I don't take it this seriously. Um, either way, you know, I have a giant list of gear that I've changed in and out of over the years, including, you know, cheap interfaces, <laughs> cheap or no turntables, CD players, all kinds of different computers, computer, you know, different cheap headphones that cables broke off of that I got for 20 bucks on the used market and so many rabbit holes of research that ended up mostly good like uh, gear that got me going especially into the recording world and just listening to stuff in a way that was above consumer grade stuff uh, however I do have, still have consumer grade stuff because 
I, I like it, but that doesn't mean that I, I let that gear get in the way of getting me the sound that I wanted. I still have high standards for that gear. I want it to perform. I want it to be flat and neutral so that I can be a good judge of you know, what it is. And at doing audio and video work, sounding good in a good room and translating to multiple different environments, it, that's part of it. But even consumer grade stuff in comparison to audiophile stuff, super expensive. I mean, hundreds of dollars, sometimes thousands that goes into total cost of components. And I'll give you price values on components as we go along, at least for market value and what I paid. And I think the point of all of this, as serious as many guys and girls get with all this stuff, I just, I just think it's so important. I think we take into consideration we need to have a standard of excellence for the gear we use because every single component plays a role in the sound and experience that you're getting and all of it goes into play when you're talking close to a hundred individual components in this room that make up the sound that plays back so it's impressive how much people throw away just to not get the experience that they want. This experience that I'm getting now is the one that I built and I wanted, and um, it's very upgradable and interchangeable if need be down the road. I think it's important to talk about that because every component is critical. And if we want to peel back the layers, especially in the analog, when we talk analog, peel back those layers, anything that gets in the way between the actual music and experience we don't want anything hindering that we want flat response and we want something that works you know i'm not going to bust out the eq curves in this room because i just want to show you that thought and intentionality went behind the choices that i made to build the space and to line up the gear so let's start with the computers and the mobile rigs and we'll dive into the the chain that goes all the way along to the speakers and to the headphones and to the stuff that i'm actually listening to and the stuff that the vinyl is touching let's get into it all right lost the bow tie i know i love the bow tie too but i'll throw on a little cool cashmere beanie my favorite one i'll show you all right i'm gonna start by showing you the gear list here then i'm gonna have some b-roll of what the actual gear looks like you know bear in mind all this stuff is fun this is something that yes i do as a serious hobby that is also a gig not not this channel but other work in the past present and future because i absolutely love this stuff it's my passion but it's also fun and you know because it has paid in the past I was able to spend some money and get some great upgrades. What was the first one? Well, the Audio I.O. was this beautiful Apollo Twin X Duo uh, that I bought maybe a couple years ago, the same time I bought the 2019 16-inch MacBook Pro um, and the 2022 custom PC that I just built in January of 2022. Built it exactly to spec as I, I wanted it at the time. Um, and, and that's, that was a blessing to be able to put every single component and I have the components list here. The Apollo Twin X Duo, it's loaded with plugins that sound great that you can use, that they really spend a lot of time trying to match analog equipment and match the real, you know, real world equipment to not just plugins that sound good. These sound excellent and top tier. And that was such a clean, to me worth it, upgrade over my previous Focusrite Sapphire uh, Pro 14 is the one I bought in 2011, but the jacks were starting to mess up on the front and, you know, I had thrown that thing around in the back of the cars and recorded with it over, you know, almost a decade before I decided to upgrade. And finally, in my opinion, a splurge because at a close to a, uh, one grand for only two, you know, XLR inputs. Um, and the only way to expand that is to upgrade into their, their racks, which sound awesome, I'm sure, but, you know, n n several thousands to just upgrade the I.O. I like the expandability options and I like a nice thing that can stand alone and just do the job by itself. So uh, great purchase. I love the knob. love how shiny it is. It goes gray and black, uh, you know, with the gray and bla black aesthetic. Huge fan of its, you know, the built-in, the DAC that it has is really good. The crystals that they use inside. <laughs> I guess I'm a crystal freak now. <laughs> I love how it sounds. It's simple and it works. And I wanted the whole thing to have balanced connections so I can put balanced XLR ins 
and out is an unbalanced to balanced cable. I don't I don't know exactly, but the, it basically ends up hitting the speakers at XLR. You know, grounding is important. If I could, I would ground my turntable. I haven't got to that point yet, which is annoying because I, I do notice the difference in, in grounding the equipment at every step, even in the computers too. Uh, the 2019 MacBook Pro. This was a work purchase. This was something my work provided. And um, it's great for playback too. I love the Apple world due to previous in, you know, video internships that I've had and audio gigs that you know make working with the Apollo Twin great. And crazily enough, working the Apollo Twin with the PC was actually great for me. Other people may have had problems and stuff troubleshooting, but the Thunderbolt works great on both PC and Mac. So I can work in both worlds and use the plugins on both if I need to. Excellent. So I love the Apple world. You know, when I'm casually listening or something late at night, you know, plug in some Bluetooth headphones into the MacBook that I can take with me to my room and just chill out and listen to music. Love that. Because it's as great as a very focused, seated listening experience in a nice treated, you know, studio room is, there's something to be said for lounging in bed, listening to tunes. And um, a lot of this is psychological and emotional, you know, the experience that we get from, uh, from these things. So the MacBook is an important piece of gear, you know, it's, there's the specs. It's, it's not a hundred percent maxed out because it doesn't need to be. It's, it's for recording zoom calls and doing, you know, light video processing and correction and edit. Nothing more than that. Really. It's a great piece of gear for, uh, for chill listening, but my custom PC, dude, this is where my eyes were opened. Not only just like a 4K video rendering powerhouse if I need to do 3D editing, which I don't really do, or intense processing and lots of plugins or lots of stuff, uh, not only for work, but just a reliable, stable playback source that could disappear and still run all the audio, like basic audio playback because I have my, my MacBook, you know, but it, it really helps with, I shoot all video in 4K now. And you know, we're talking really long files and lots and lots of color correction or processing that I want to add on and make it perfect. Make it, make it, make it that French kiss touch of perfection that I, I want not only polished, but just exact that I want my videos to have. So, I, you know, this powerhouse of a PC just works in the background. Hallelujah. It just works. Uh, I love it. I love every piece of gear on this thing. You know, as I was building it, I got some help from my uncle via text, but I, I built this myself and uh, I went to uh, Micro Center and picked up these parts, every single component and built. That was a preliminary stage. You can even see the floor tiles on the bottom there. My old turntable up there, Crosley. <laughs> I used it as a, a prop just to hold vinyl on. <laughs> Because it didn't sound great for vinyl, but hey, it holds up the vinyl itself. That works too, right? The backside of the PC case, so looking at it gutted from the front right there. Um, and the fancy RGB going right there. I was so happy to get that thing booted up for the first time. That was a picture of excitement right there. Um, and that was it. Finally, uh, booting up for reels right there. And that's actually the back cabling before I got it even tidier. Um, yeah, I'm happy with it. Like it sits there, it runs in the background. It doesn't take up a ridiculous amount of power, but it, it definitely takes up its fair share of all the components in the house. Looks great. And it's got the, I mean, it's big old case, the full tower. My uncle's like, dude, I love that full ATX tower. I was like, I didn't know if I wanted to do it because it is so big and takes up a giant amount of space, not super portable. But it, it looks so huggable and warm and uh, I don't know, it's my best bud. It's it's not just a piece of gear, it's it's like family, like a terrible corporate job calling an employee family. Uh, anyway, before we jump into the uh, analog gear, let's go ahead and talk about what I, what I use to listen to stuff. Yeah, I'm running Spotify. What are you... What are you guys kidding around acting like you don't listen to Spotify? Come on, Spotify is great. I got so many playlists on here, close to 500 now. I, I've honed in this Spotify since 2000 and like, this one probably since 2011, but definitely before that too. 
yeah, end of 2011, I think I got my Spotify. Uh, heard about it through a friend, and um, I think the way I described Spotify after uh, showing my mom was uh, like literally, mom, you could go to the library and just grab anything you want and take it with you. It was unreal. It changed. It changed how I listened because. I was able to listen to anything I wanted, tons of new stuff that I can listen to, engage if I like it, just like YouTube um, and Apple Music and all these other streaming sites. But I love Spotify because I can build in a listen queue of stuff and just throw thousands of songs in it, listen to it, move it to other playlists. And, and you know, when I'm in the car, I got my phone, just plug it in via aux or bluetooth and uh, shuffle play or download now my friends back in the day were like dude you could download it put it all your spotify playlist on an sd card and then max it out and then you could have everything offline play and not even use data and i was like oh that'd be awesome to do but i didn't go quite that nerdy and i ended up just using mobile data to stream the songs that i love and want to hear in the car now before i get into that when we talk about digital we need to talk about dax so I'm going to jump down the list to this right here. The DAC headphone amp, the topping NX4. There's tons of DACs and stuff on the market. I don't know, but some of them have like mixed reviews or they're not clean, not flat. The reason why I went with topping got amazing results when tested on the Audio Science Review website. And that's what I wanted. I want something that performs. And it was small and portable. So what I do is... When I'm in the car, or even in my room, I'll do this. This also plugs in via micro USB to whatever I want, USB-C on my phone, USB-C Thunderbolt on MacBook. Or if I wanted this to be iPhone, if I had an iPhone, or run this into my P in and out of my PC if I wanted to, you can also run it in and out via aux. And um, it's got a headphone phone port, so you can send the DAC to whatever you want. Speakers, aux in your car, or like I said, a pair of headphones for hi-fi on the go. And this topping NX4 blew my mind. Simple charging via micro USB, simple output normally through micro USB to USB-C right into my phone. I can select Spotify on my phone, plug it into my car, and shuffle play high quality streams, as high quality as it, almost as high quality as it could be for streaming sounds super clean and the amp of my car or the headphones whatever this thing drives sounds excellent whatever this thing drives drives me to get where i need to be on the go or at home it's worth it the dac changed my listening experience 150 bucks now i'll tell you a funny story too mine was free because they had some amazon mess up where they didn't send it in time and i was able to get a full refund for it for a listening device that changed the way I listen to music for free. Amazing. Amazing little DAC headphone amp combo, the topping NX4. Yeah, I put on some Fleetwood Mac for mom and watch her cry uh, because it sounds so clean. <laughs> and uh, I don't think she'd ever heard anything like that. And I, what did I run it into, you ask? Well, I ran it into, uh, if we're still in the you know digital type, hybrid digital analog listening world, I ran it into some headphones. I ran it into some very consumer but flat frequency response based on audio science review. Bose QC35 number twos, Mark twos. Outstanding. Uh, the noise canceling is second to none based on what many people said, but of anything that I've heard noise canceling, even the AirPods and stuff like that. Um, I just don't like those. I like the headphones experience. I like it enclosed. I don't like the open back. That's just me. I, I need dialed in isolation it's not a perfect frequency response and there's some eq curves they put on audio science review to kind of customize it because uh, it's lacking in some of the mid upper mids it needs a little bit of a boost and a little bit of a two to five k but we're talking a couple db this thing is super flat for consumer headphones with great isolation and coming at around 200 to 300 bucks uh, through work i was able to get those um Truly amazing. I don't like to sing praises of like the consumer electronic world because there's a lot of 
for-profit corporations just trying to sell as many units as possible. So I don't want to be I don't want to be part of that, but I, I absolutely love the basic performance that I'm able to get um, as a standard as a standard of excellence. And I do want to upgrade those too when I upgrade the speakers. Clean design, super stretchy, 3.5 millimeter if I need it, Bluetooth if I need it, noise canceling if I need it, volume controls on the headphone if it's running Bluetooth. It's just great. Folds flat and fits neatly in the, in the little case that they give you and charges via micro USB. It's fine. I don't think it's an experience that'll blow your head off, but for critical listening and whoa. Yeah, baby. And and detail work, I, I do think it, it does it justice. Can't keep a camera to sit flat today. All right. What else in the digital domain? I will listen to the title. I, I do love me some title. Title actually supports artists and um Thankful for Title and what it's doing for that reason. I don't know. Um, Title. I just haven't spent enough time with Title to justify listening to it all the time. If I'm doing some critical listen, if I want that little extra boost, that little extra something, I do put on Title streams, uh, and it, it does make a difference, especially with the DAC good headphones. Listening to it side by side, you do hear that little bit of higher quality stream. Now I don't do the master streams because. I think the master streams is kind of a gimmick and several YouTubers and audio guys have kind of exposed why the title master is not really a master and it's adding artificial. I don't want to get too nerdy, but like it's not exactly what it claims to be as the master pure experience. I think just maxing it out at Hi-Fi did wonders for me. I do love title. Got the free tier now because I spend all my time just listening on Spotify. I just dial in my listening experience and quickly save and find stuff that I like and want to hear again. In the digital realm, I guess I could show you one other thing I could, oh no, not that. What the heck is that? Reaper. There we go. Reaper. Digital audio workstation. This has been a main stay for all of my recordings and processing audio digitally. Really analyzing it works wonders with Mac, PC, Thunderbolt, USB interfaces, whatever. It just, it lets you dial in this, the exact sample rate and all the nerdy stuff that you want and create projects and, you know, run amazing sets of plugins and digital instrumentation and, and analog instrumentation and even have a vinyl mastering or preset that I basically run, you know, left and right channels into a basic frequency analyzer and I'm able to, with this, if I go in, I'm able to see um, lovely, um, you know, 60 cycle hum right there, you know, and see the audio and the DB, where the audio is hitting at the frequency spectrum and even add in uh, that plug-in UA precision channel strip plug-in that's been matched to the analog equipment circuit matched apparently uh, with the EQ set to the exact frequency ranges that it recommends for my Bose QC35 Mark IIs. I'm able to turn this off and on if I want and and voila I have that little extra pepper salt and pepper seasons the music so then if i want on here i can press record and zoom in and see the waveform where you know where that would where it would be right there and dub my vinyl to the digital domain or just record anything and bring it into the digital domain where we use this stuff for social media marketing and all of these uh digital things the way that you're receiving this video right now that same way i love digital audio workstations Pro Tools, Cubase, Fruity Loops, Ableton, all, all the great ones. Uh, Reaper's legendary as well. Just works for what I needed to do. And it works cross-platform and it's been stable, stable, stable as a recording platform for years. And I don't have to pay monthly subscriptions and weird updates that may or may not work. It, it just works. Stability. I love it. That's the digital domain. If you want, check out some of my Spotify playlists on my profile there. I'll link it down below. I mean, I got 
I got some pretty good playlists on here, if I don't say so myself. I got basically all the albums I've ever liked categorized by, you know, decades or years. It's great for me when I just want to shuffle play stuff that I like. I might like it. We turn off that 60 cycle hum. All right. Um, we're talking about entering the analog domain. It's just a different world. And the gear that it requires and the attention to detail that it requires and having it, uh, you know, set up to perform excellently is, it was a task to figure out in and of itself, even though I'd worked in the audio <laughs> domain for, you know, a decade. I had to learn what's a turntable do, what's a turntable mat do, what's a cart do, what's a phono pre, uh, like all this, these new things that literally like no one that I'd ever, you know, interacted with <laughs> which is funny, I don't know why. You know, I, I did that and I ended up with something I can be proud of to share with you today. It's a part of vinyl shootout videos, part of really dissecting the analog, enjoying the experience. And uh, it really did change the way I listen to music. I say that all the time. Vinyl, putting a, putting a piece of wax on my Crosley turntable and dropping the needle for the first time of an album that I loved. It changed the way I listen to music the attention to detail and the pure solid waveform that it creates as Jack White described it's like the difference between digital and analog is digital is like a pencil making points as a wave making a lot of pencil points maybe 64,000 or 100,000 or a million of these points to make that same wave that goes up and down but analog is one straight line and that's what they say about DSD but we're not going to go into the nerdy talk Analog is something to be respected and understood, and it is by a, a whole new generation of people just like me who just enter in this analog domain and trying to figure it out. Let me show you. The turntable that I'm using is the Audio Technica AT, <laughs> stupid Audio Technica name, LP W30 TK. As factory, it comes with a very cheap cart, but a great upgraded tone arm amazing wood plinth with customizable you know feet uh, options for 33s and 45s a rubber mat and uh, a belt drive turntable adjustments for setting the weight and the anti-skate and dropping the the needle I it works it was in my budget I was able to get money off because I had spent money at Guitar Center to get the Apollo Twin X and they gave me in-store credit to use with my gear card toward another Guitar Center purchase, I bought this. It gave me like a hundred bucks off. Amazing. Now I have a fully manual belt drive turntable uh, thanks to other audio purchases. Now there's other ones in the same realm you can get. Now, I don't think they're the same price point, which doesn't make any sense. I think you're paying for maybe a carbon fiber tone arm and a different cart that might be a little better, maybe better some other way, but um, or even better one that looks like something you would get that almost looks like a u-turn or a project I'll, i like it but i like the stability of the audio technical world and i'm not 100 percent if i want to stick with audio technica i'm going to do some more research and figure out what that next step up is going to be but this is this was something that i wanted to step up and say okay now i'm serious about analog what do i want so i got this but i don't like that wooden plinth i wanted to matte black this whole thing out and that's what you're looking at over there a matte black customized. I even sanded those sharp edges with a, with some kind of belt sander I borrowed from my friend. Prepped it and matte black India inked the crap out of it. Every single component uh, black, except the, the head shell and cart. The head shell and cart, we upgraded as well as the mat. So the turntable mat, we got one from Vinyl Store Solutions, a special edition cork and rubber hybrid mat. They're sold out of the special edition and it's, it's got cool mixture of cork and rubber which is good it was his preferred slip mat because it's a unique combination of cork and nitrile rubber uh, it's a composite layer absorbs resonances and vibrations which is awesome avoids static load uh, i'm guessing the cork helps with isolation at the expense of some uh, static but it does avoid static really good uh, sometimes every once in a while i have to grab the record and lift it off because there will be a little static, especially certain times of the year. Precision manufactured in the EU. Cool. Packaged flat. Um, came in great packaging. 
loved it. It was like 35 bucks, so I was like, let me go for it. And I uh, didn't regret it at all, but the, you know, that's, that's just making a slight difference. I really wanted to make a difference and ask any nerd, they'll tell you this is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to changing and upgrading the sound, uh, other than the turntable itself, you know, is the cartridge. So I went for Audio-Technica. VM750 SH dual moving magnet cartridge. Uh, I didn't buy it from direct. I brought it from Amazon, like uh, one of those deals or open box deals. It was awesome. The box wasn't even beat up. I didn't pay nearly that, but they're, they run about 450. And uh, that's what it looks like up close. Super cool brushed gold and the brown. You can flip that thing down to block and protect uh, the needle, the stylus underneath. And that's the cart, but it comes with, by default, a replacement stylus. There it is, VMN 50 SH. Uh, just without the seven, I guess, is the only difference there. Or in instead of the seven, right there. Um, that Shibata stylus cartridge, Premier 700 series, blah, blah, blah. Shibata really is accurate, so I wanted to spend time. Alignment tool protractor and nail it because they say if if you got the finer the tip is those little nuances that make the difference so i really wanted to dial it in i nailed it front center left right and back on on the exact cartridge alignment with that shibata stylus sounds excellent for analog playback i love it i'm thinking about just replacing the stylus and going for it again because uh, it works great with the audio technical world they keep you in that world Yes, they do. There's the styli. The Phono Pre, oh boy. Now we're, now we're running through the turntable. What is the turntable hitting? Well, it's hitting a couple things. It's hitting the, the Phono Pre, the isolation around it, and it's hitting DAC or the audio IO, in this case, the Apollo Twin X, of course, up here. Um, so what are we looking at? We're looking at, actually, let's, let's talk isolation first. So turntable is sitting on, actually, let's change the battery and we'll talk about what happens next? Oh boy, okay. The six acoustic York Mark One. I. I can use the Audio Technica built in preamp that they have with the AT LPW32K, uh, but it kind of sounded crappy, and I was like, I bet I could get more out of it than that. Uh, and by crappy, what I mean is it didn't sound clean. It just didn't, it wasn't pleasant to listen to. It was just doing its basic job, which is to amplify the analog into a reasonable listening range so i bought a while hiding the other info i guess i'll show you right here this was in you know may of 2021 as i was building this a cambridge audio duo moving coil and moving magnet options for different cartridges phono preamp in silver looked a lot like my apollo twin which i thought was awesome and it had good reviews and a lot of people said it was pretty clean and a good baseline I liked it, and I thought, man, you know, for $199, it's a good component companion to, you know, my $200 roughly turntable, you know, two to $400 cartridge. I thought it really improved the baseline sound of the built-in preamp, and it did. Having a good phono preamp, a nice clean one, is great too. But why did I go to the Six Acoustic York Mark I? Well... I heard somebody say it on YouTube and they went exactly from the Cambridge Audio Duo to this and they said it matched up audio wise with phono preamps that sounded almost a thousand bucks. And I was like, that's what I want. Something that's going to match up to those, the big competitors, according to this website, the York Mark One. Performance in line with elite high end phono preamps without the elite price tag. I love that. And they're not just saying that too. This is uh, several people online. I like that you can dial in a couple extra things. And this was the selling point for me because it has everything else the same as the Cambridge Audio Duo, but two things. It has a volume knob right there. It's actually a gain knob right there. And you, being able to lower that or raise that based on whatever, that really does help. Gain, dialing in the gain. Design looks great, super clean looking. I did like the looks better because I like the light silver. I don't know, I just like light silver better than dark silver, dark gray. It had a grounding thing there. I don't remember if the Duo had a ground. Okay, it does, but it has a balance level, but not a gain level. So that was a determining factor, but more so. I like that they're showing you under the hood. 
I like to see my components. I like to see what it's touching. There it is. So this is what I'm talking about right here on the bottom of the unit. You got six things you can control with the dip switch and uh, exact load control. To be able to dial in the sound is super important because uh, not every cartridge is built the same. They don't sound the same. And, and raising and lowering the impedance and these really nerdy things affect the sound. And just dialing it in correctly because you could try every single one of these combinations, but to get to one that sounds the best for your unit, that's what I wanted. I was so impressed with the sound difference uh, between this and the Cambridge Audio Duo. Now, the grounding's not perfect somehow in my house unit. It's grounded great in the, in the unit itself. Could be my turntable, could be the, you know, the mains of the house, but it doesn't sound perfect. Uh, you still have some hum, but I was able to get that hum, you know, minus 80 dB, really low threshold of hearing when I'm listening to stuff in the room. I, I messaged the, the team, the customer service about it, and they said, hey, did you check? Did you try and dial all the stuff in? And I did, so I think it is the mains. But I just love that they were nice and open about their product. They wanted it to sound right. Simple controls amazing detail and ability to dial it in with correct impedance load input load control uh, and gain that gain switch on the front being able to control 500 canadian now i don't think it was that much before i i genuinely think it was like 400 i'm gonna verify that <laughs> maybe i was wrong i paid 420 american dollars for it and after tax it raised it to about 500 so it might have gone up in price it looks like it has i mean um, I remember it being under 500 or right at 500 because I didn't want something that was like a thousand because you know my other gear is not quite at a thousand per and budget friendly is nice even though I want it to be the best component I can for the price. I love that it's a smaller company and that they really really care uh, they've cared for years and years about high quality sound reproduction. That's why I got that phono pre. Now what is it hitting on the way to the phono? It is hitting some isoacoustics or a bronze. And there's different ones, but that's just hitting the direct contact line between turntable feet, you know, the Ikea shelf that it's under, the wall, the floor, all the things. So I want as much, every single part of the chain, so I'm not hearing anything else. It's not the music. And um, two inch little puck, and it can hold eight pounds on the bronze, which is the one I have per unit. So, you know, I, if I get a little heavier turntable, I'll still be able to use this. And I like that because um, I almost went with the heavier ones, but it was significantly more in price for the Indigo or the Bordeaux. Um, and I thought about even doing that for <laughs> for the speakers, but concrete really kind of does the heavy lifting. So I'm happy with it. Not not open to using these because they do sound uh, just slightly marginally better and they do isolate for audio components and for speakers. I like that it's simple and movable too. Uh, sound clarity helps, sound stage, and it works with or without the feet. I've tried it both ways. I do like it with the feet because I like to control and dial in the leveling of the turntable itself. So I actually get out a, a yellow level from Home Depot when I'm leveling up the turntable. I mean, I spent all that time isolating and grounding and doing all this stuff with a cartridge and mounting it to the wall and putting it in the room. I want everything to be level. And so I get out the level, I put it under the pucks, I adjust the turntable feet on the pucks and then the pucks isolate and kind of raise it as well. The whole turntable is now raised to fit the Phono preamp, turntable clamp, and you know, 45 adapters, stuff like that. It it really is slick. Uh, I love the Orea series from ISO Acoustics. Can recommend. Another thing that comes out of the turntable preamp before it hits the, you know, the gear that leads to the speakers is this Jensen Transformers ISO Max CL or CI 2RR. Now what the heck is this? Why would I do this? Hearing that mains hum, I originally had the issue of grounding and it's, it's important to ground. What I wanted was something that actually physically, scientifically, you know, grounds with a grounding wire um, components to the ground, you know, so that we're not we're not dealing with this hum and buzz caused by ground loops. And uh, it does that 
with and without it, I was able to AB, I think, 10 to 20 dB, maybe at max, of just noisy noise from mains and weird stuff. And just that little bit brings it even further out of that audible range so that I'm just hearing the good stuff. And, and they show you the graphs. That's what I love about this stuff. They show you the graphs. You can hit the graph and you can see, oh, wow, that's the deviation from the linear phase, the phase distortion. This is your frequency response. Just showing you how it actually affects real world playback. Uh, it is lowering the noise floor. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's all these words they use for the interference and you know we don't we don't live in a perfect space and what this does is cleans up the chain and you know if you live in a noisy chain if you can't figure out what the problem is why you're hearing all this other weird stuff and you want to try something that might work for your analog equipment I, I can recommend this the ISO max actually does ground the two channels the left and the right of the RCA cable that goes from your turntable you know if you don't have a balanced connection that's the next step is actually to get a balanced XLR three prong connection the same that would connect to the you know Apollo Twin X unit however I, we don't live in a perfect world and I'm not changing the mains of the house and I'm not changing my turntable yet so I'm going to use this ISO max and uh, it makes it sound just that little bit of attention to detail better so what does it hit after that? It's hitting that adapter, it's hitting those cables, it's running down to the floor cleanly and labeled into the back of the Apollo Twin interface. And that Apollo Twin interface is sending it to speakers. And what are the speakers sitting on? Well, they're sitting on concrete blocks. They're sitting on a deluxe French luxury brand called Concrete Blocks. And the Concrete Blocks are wet lock sealed from Home Depot. They're painted black with India ink and spray paint. And they're just ridiculously heavy. Whoa. 360 pounds. More grounding than isolation. I, concrete's not isolating. Concrete is like if you if you hold up an instrument to it and you play it, it's gonna sound louder. That's what concrete does. It's it's a resonant material. So it's sending it into the absorbed floor and isolating it firmly from hitting different reflective surfaces other than the desk is the only reflective surface that the speakers might be hitting and um, that's the goal is to get just speakers i'd rather have the speakers floating in the room hitting my ears not affected by anything else in the room and that's 180 pounds left and right just like someone holding the speaker for me just grounded to the floor and it's just but it's just not affected by the person holding it <laughs> it's just stable um i love it and if i do get a studio one day with a, with a concrete floor putting concrete on concrete just puts the speakers in a situation where they're gonna sound right in the room so can't recommend concrete blocks for every situation but i personally it's my favorite speaker stand of all time. And it's just kind of cool to spend way less than all the speaker other speaker stands out there and um, get something that's substantial and kind of beautiful in, a, in and of itself in a simplistic way, in a minimalistic way. So I love it. We'll get into the speakers, but I got to talk about what the vinyl is being hit with. Oh, man. I, if I can, I ultrasonically clean it. Uh, but that's not always possible for every single album I have couple hundred now so i found this squeaky clean vinyl mark three it's his third iteration of it. this dude just makes them 3d prints them yeah made in canada and he makes this unit and he has a little video talking about why he did it the impetus and how much he loves it and uses it um right there and he's proud of it it's it just attaches to a shop vac with the connection right there you put that nice thing he designed and it it's made with like commercial grade materials that's supposed to hold like a significant like 100 pounds or something amount of weight <laughs> and um the magnets are super strong like rare earth magnets or something. i don't know but like <laughs> it's really handy to vacuum clean wet clean vacuum clean records uh, and he gives you the recipe and he sends it there's a link here it blew my mind it's the ljc london jazz collectors home recipe 
for vacuum record cleaning machines. It's a home brew and it gives you the exact amounts of the ingredients that you need, where to get them and how to do it and how to store it so that you can apply it. And I apply it with some, you know, basically paint brushes from Home Depot, paint it on, use the record cleaner and just make them as quiet and is dust free and particle free from the vinyl new vinyl factory that it comes in as possible. I like too that this website shows you what it's doing up close. So, you know, all the stuff that accumulates the dust and crap and just makes it cleaner. Now it's not going to be perfect and it will have some static because vacuums, that's what they do. They create static, but disclaimer here about, you know, <laughs> be careful. Cause it's an, it's an exact recipe, but it's very cheap in comparison to these other, like these already pre-made mixtures of brews that you can do from home. And all you have to do is uh, just have a place to store it. You got a super cheap vinyl cleaning uh, machine that's price justifiable and gets you basically as far as you can without going ultrasonic. And uh, ultrasonic is the way to go. It does make it like dead quiet. But I'm going to tell you something. Not everybody has how many several thousand, th th thousands of dollars to drop on a good ultrasonic that's going to work if you have a large collection. Not justifiable for everybody. It wasn't for me. So I got this unit and it also works great if I need to do a quick dusting because I can just give it a spin, dust it, get it off with a microfiber quick. It sits right next to the turntable. Love my little RCM and my homebrew wet cleaning thanks to that recipe from that website i'm gonna show you the headphone amp it's a, a sheet asgard too um i got this when i traded my phono preamp sounds okay um not as great as my topping in x4 no definitely not um and it does heat up and it gets is bulky it takes up space not a perfect piece of gear not cheap i mean for a couple hundred bucks it just doesn't really do i mean it sounds better than like a headphone jack on a computer or a phone. It's better, but it's not even as good as the Topping NX4 of like amazing response and like actually enhancing just the cleaning up the digital sound, processing it the right way. It's fine. I'm looking to get rid of it because uh, I love my DAC headphone amp combo, the Topping NX4. It's portable, sounds better. <laughs> looks great. There's people saying they can run, you can just keep these plugged in and just run them if you want it as like a permanent non-mobile station, workstation setup, you can do that. So I love my Topping NX4. Talked about my headphones. I love them for now, but my speakers, they're the JBL 305P Mark IIs, the second iteration, save 38%. They. <laughs> They're okay. I've seen a couple, I've seen several of these in many different studios and I've seen them in videos too. And ah, uh, it's it not grounded at all right there. <laughs> Just sitting on the desk. But I like that you can kind of tune the EQ of them. You can do some uh, high frequency trim and you control the volume independently. I bust out the DB meter on my phone sometimes and make sure I can hear things, you know, exactly clean from the left and from the right in the room because every room's different. You can even change input sensitivity right there. It just gives you options, balanced connection. You know, it's just like the basic requirement for a studio monitor. These aren't hi-fi speakers. These aren't big speakers that are meant to make lots and lots of noise. They're made to be in a small room like this. And I really do feel like I've gotten the most out of these speakers because I've tuned the room, I've tuned the speakers to the room and I know them. And that's a big part of this is knowing what you're dealing with. I like it. It, it works. I don't know. I, I might keep them as reference, but because um, they're great. I'm so used to them. But I will say it's not really giving me that audio file sound. It's giving me a clean understanding of what's going on sonically. And uh, it can, they can get loud too. Don't, don't mistake them for, uh, for a cute little uh, lame studio monitor. It really performs flat enough and loud enough to be used in a audio file setting to put on some great records and blast it and dance your butt off to it in this room. I'm telling you, it does sound great in this room. Showed you my DAW and I showed you some of the plugins that I use. Those are just some of the names of it. Make, make some music on YouTube as well. Just wanted to throw that on Discogs. Man, that's, that's what I use every day. 
when I'm listening to music or working on stuff. Another big thing that is part of the gear, in my opinion, is the Oob Cubes. I made three videos already in 2022 about these Oob Cubes. Um, because storage is important of all this, not only gear, but the vinyl and the analog stuff too, man. This company nailed it. Portability, flexibility, functionality, and aesthetic that I've been looking for for so long just to hold vinyl, but also like for little itty bitty pieces of gear too with individual drawers that I can label and organize, find stuff super, super quick. <laughs> it just works. Very, very price competitive too and expandable. Um, they nailed it. Oobcube are the people. I, I know a guy who works there named Brandon. Brandon's awesome. Located in Missouri, in the United States. Super small startup that happened to, to start up in 2022, and um, I love the work they're doing. I needed to shout them out because it it's one of my favorite pieces of gear, really. Like I've been telling everybody I run into at record stores, like any person who's interested in like storage solutions, I just I always tell them about Oobcube. They're such a unique unique crate that solves the issues that one or two or a combination of those few don't solve singularly. They just, they've done it. They've perfected the crate in my opinion. They keep innovating the production and they're gonna do more in 2023, they said. Uh, and I will make videos talking about uh, the innovations that they do for the Oob Cubes. Cause I have a total of nine of them. I built the world's first Oob Cube wall. <laughs> and I only use eight right now. I gave two of them away. I actually had 10 at one point. And uh, the eight that I have, the Grabnet and the six for vinyl and the one portable, like it just works. It just fits what I need. And uh, I can completely collapse it and, and move them, repurpose them if I need to. It was the perfect solution. That and a combination of some of the beautiful Ikea products that are just, you know, nice looking in rooms. You know, all the components that I use are ultimately just products that work together to create audio experience among other things but that's the primary focus especially of this channel and of the vinyl shootouts and the music reviews and fun audio stuff it's not necessarily why i do what i do because i need this stuff to work practically and uh and functionally and that's what all of it is i know for me personally just watching gear rundown or rig rundown videos i get inspired to you know, hone in and expand and learn about other people's process so that I can make it my own. I know this will do the same for some of you who are trying to figure out some components, you know, think creatively about using the space in a way that makes sense for you and using the gear that you need to work for you and in a good price point. So thanks for sticking around. We're going to keep researching. We're going to keep making it better. We're going to keep honing it in, dialing it in. We're going to keep listening to the music that we love. And that's what this is about. But more than anything else, you need to keep on grooving your way.